Welcome back to Pod Save the World. I'm Tommy Vitor. I'm Ben Rhodes. Ben, all the way live from Washington, D.C. Has the blob found you yet? Is it like slowly rolling to your studio? Yeah, the, there's a, a group of agitated people outside my hotel. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I have never laughed harder than I did the other day reading that New York Times story about members of the D.C. Uh, foreign policy establishment or the blob, as you branded them, being mad about being called the blob. It was uh, incredible. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of funny because the article only then proceeds to quote people who I think would largely be perceived as a part of the blob. And I saw some people kind of complaining about that, like, why aren't there other voices? But I think that was kind of her point. (laughs) Yeah. The best is the guy who's like lamenting uh, the hurt feelings of the blob. And his title is the the Henry A. Kissinger Distinguished something or other. The Henry A. Kissinger Distinguished Professor of Global Affairs at the Johns Hopkins (laughs) School of Advanced (laughs) International Studies. Yeah. yeah. I'm not knocking academia, but yeah, that was the, the, I think it was Sarah Lyle was her name. She did a brilliant job of doing just like an understated. Yeah, she was trolling everybody, (laughs) including me to some extent, which is totally fine. Like the blob was something I I invented on the fly, but uh, it was good. Also, Ben, you know, before we get to a very serious, important show today, uh, Dan had some very harsh words for your decision to go to Bob Woodward's house and to eat soup with him during a book interview. It it felt like 2007, 2008, we were getting our our legs chopped out from Dan on comms issues. Do you want to respond? You you have the mic now, open floor. I felt like I was once again 29 years old and in the campaign office in Chicago Mm -hmm. and had made some rookie mistake that here's the thing about podcasts that's great. Dan was the kind of guy that wouldn't like yell at you, but you would know that he was pissed at you. Like he had, a, you know, he wouldn't respond to your email for like seven hours, <laughs> yeah. and it was like being able to overhear how he was complaining about something I did to somebody else. Yeah, um, he obviously was correct, although I will say that it was a very good bowl of soup, mm. um, and uh, I, you know, I think I. I mean, sometimes you got to play ball, right? I mean, I, I think I, I made our case there in that book. Uh, I was I wasn't I wasn't dishing against the team, which is what you're usually most worried about. With no, you, you but, weren't dishing. You were, you were I, slurping. I, I did I, feel I, like I was listening to Dan talk to like Bill Burton about me. Uh, AOL, exactly. I am in Ben Smith in 2007 and how I wasn't exactly. allowed to do that. And, and, and I, 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 it hurt because Dan was 100 percent right. <laughs> you know, like, like <laughs> per I, usual. I, I didn't disagree with anything he said. I was like, yeah, yeah, he's right about that. Kind of a rookie mistake. Didn't make it again. Sorry about that. Well, at least Dan now knows that he's going to uh, come at us on this show. We're going to clap back. Yeah, our, we'll uh, find a way to come back at Dan. With, with our platform. Speaking of clapping back, so we are going to talk about a lot of good stuff today, including why a security pact between the U.S., the U.K., and Australia has our French friends furious. Mm. Uh, there's elections in Canada and Russia, the assassination of an Iranian scientist, more trouble at the southern border. The U.N. General Assembly is happening now as we speak. Ben, can you feel the progress all the way down in D.C.? The world is changing as we speak, underneath uh, our feet. Incredible. The, the um, sea's rise is being slowed. You know, all those things are happening. Yes, all sorts of good stuff. We had a quick update on Ethiopia, uh, some news about Boris Johnson, and some news about Space Force. And then, Ben, you did our interview today. You are in D.C., as I mentioned before. You were in the swamp. Which uh, which creature did you pull out of the, the pool to, to interview for today? Well, I think the, the the most worldo member of the United States Senate, uh, Chris Murphy, the um, least swampy U.S. senator. Yeah, to be yeah, tr- you know we love Chris Murphy, but you know we covered a lot of ground here because I wanted you know he wrote a great piece for Crooked.com, kind of defending the Afghanistan decision. We unpacked kind of his argument there, but then we really looked forward to like what does this mean for the future of American foreign policy? Shouldn't we be looking at not just ending the Afghan war, but perhaps winding down our use of drones, given what we saw in the the tragic drone strike? Um, What are the priorities for U.S. foreign policy going forward? Why the hell can we not confirm uh, nominees because Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley are assholes? Mm -hmm. Um, And he gave a good uh, readout of his recent trip to Lebanon uh, with some pretty concrete recommendations for how to address an issue that you and I have talked about without a lot of good answers. So definitely worth a listen. The French are very angry. Yes. And we are going to talk about why in a minute, but let's first back up and maybe give the listeners a little context here. So last week, President Biden, uh, Prime Minister Scott Morrison of Australia and Prime Minister Boris Johnson of the United Kingdom, one of our personal favorites, announced a new security partnership between those three countries. They're calling it AUKUS, which just rolls right off the tongue. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't say this explicitly at the event, but the goal of AUKUS is to bolster militaries. 
uh, in the Asia Pacific region to push back on the threat from China, uh, which now has the world's largest navy. Although you know they have smaller yeah. boats, but whatever. We're not going to. It's a motion in the ocean thing. The, the no, biggest piece, measuring, yeah, yeah. The biggest piece of this partnership is an agreement where the U.S. and the U.K. are going to help Australia to build nuclear-powered submarines. The the details of exactly how are TBD. Uh, there's like an 18-month process to figure it out. But it's a big deal because this is going to involve sharing some very sophisticated nuclear propulsion technology with the Australians. American submarines, British submarines, are powered by bomb-grade, highly enriched uranium, or HEU. And it's likely the U.S. will have to give the Australians this kind of nuclear fuel to power their subs. Just to, be, to clear out one thing, we're talking about the propulsion of the subs and how they get moved, not nuclear missiles. We're talking about nuclear fuel. But anyway, why, why don't we start there, Ben? I mean, what do you think the strategy was behind this new alliance, the AUKUS? Uh, and what do you make of concerns from nonproliferation experts who say that transferring this kind of nuclear technology is dangerous and it sets back efforts to eradicate nuclear weapons? So first of all, what do people get out of this? And then what are the concerns? Um, on the upside for the countries involved, um, for the Australians, they get this kind of world-class sub and this kind of deeper association with the, the U.S. military, uh, obviously the strongest military power in, in the Pacific region. Um, the U.K., which kind of helped broker this, um, they get, I, I, I think, a very clear demonstration of how they would like to be seen in the world post-Brexit. You know, that they have these key allies like the United States and Australia. They're big players, even in uh, regions like uh, the Indo-Pacific. Um, and what does the U.S. get? I mean, what the U.S. gets is a demonstration that, you know, we are ramping up our alliances and our presence in this critical region. This is all about China. I wish they'd just come out and say that. I don't know why we have to- like, I know. Why do we hide the ball? Yeah, yeah, like, like, no. like, like The Chinese aren't confused. Yeah, yeah. The Chinese know what <laughs> this is about. It's about sending a message that we're kind of evolving and advancing our presence um, in that region. The fact that it's called Indo-Pacific, too, is, is, is a testament to the way in which this region has evolved. We used to call it the Asia Pacific. It's mm -hmm. Indo-Pacific because we want to bring the idea that India is a part of this and that, that, that the Chinese can't push everybody around, that we're building kind of this alliance of countries uh, and partnership between countries like Australia, the United States, India, Japan, South Korea, all our kind of team there in the Asia Pacific, other countries, obviously, of course. Um, so and I think the Biden team would say that, look, this is, you know, at a time when the United States is is pivoting away from uh, the war in Afghanistan, this is a demonstration that, you know, countries like Australia are betting on us uh, for a partnership and a critical uh, military area like this. Um, and so it's a it's a manifestation of their their strategy, their China strategy, their Indo-Pacific strategy, um, and this kind of uh, evolution of our alliances. There's some interesting stuff alluded to about dealing with the development of artificial intelligence and new technologies. There wasn't a lot of detail about that, but I think what that's indicating is, you know, the next generation of of threats and innovation, we're going to have these closer partnerships. I think on the proliferation concern is the the technology that supports the nuclear propulsion you talked about um, has a proliferation risk. And so we are sharing sensitive technologies with Australia that if Australia decided uh, to kind of take that and repurpose it and use it in pursuit of a nuclear weapon, it might make it easier for them to do that. Um, and obviously, they don't detail exactly the, 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 the type of material that is used in, in the nuclear subs. But clearly, you're sharing something that is, is usually not in the possession of non-nuclear states. And I think the proliferation concern that, that people have is less that like Australia is going to take this and break out and build the nuclear weapon, but that it could kind of break a seal where other countries like China, for instance, uh, might start doing this with other countries who present a greater proliferation risk, that it's it's just a weakening of the nonproliferation regime in the same way, uh, if world does want an analogy, that the U.S.-India Civil Nuclear <clears throat> Cooperation Agreement uh, did back in the earlier 2000s, when once again, with a kind of strategic partner with the China nexus, we agreed to a kind of nuclear sharing agreement that was uh, uncomfortable. To those who think that the non-proliferation regime and goal should be more important than whatever strategic goal uh, is advanced by this kind of sharing. On balance, it makes sense, given the, the direction and orientation of US foreign policy in that part of the world, 
um, obviously the the French angle is, is uh, in addition to the proliferation angle, which is real one and which I think should get a lot of attention and there should be you know, continued accountability on, hey, what safeguards are there and how are you going to make sure that this doesn't kind of break a seal for further proliferation? The, the, the main media concern is the French issue. Yeah. And then you sort of on, on that, you know, UK angle, I think the UK also will get to use Australia as basically a base for their nuclear powered subs. So that will just help them like protect power even further into the into the region. I mean, I, I saw one report that mentioned that um, China accounts for 42 percent of all military spending across Asia. Uh, there are some people who are worried that, you know, this partnership will essentially kickstart an arms race among countries like Japan or South Korea or others in the region to try to match China's spending at the U.S.'s behest. But I, I don't know. I mean, I guess if China is already spending at those levels, you know, you could kind of argue it both ways. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think there's that's a right concern to have. I mean, the, the theory of the case that dates back to the Obama years, frankly, is that we wanted our friends in the region to be more engaged, more seized with the challenges coming from China and more connected, not just to us, but to each other. Um, And so that that includes like the kind of core allies we have in that part of the world, Japan, South Korea, um, Australia, New Zealand, newer partnerships like India, um, and then countries that, you know, we work well with that aren't, you know, allies in the traditional sense, but, you know, Singapore, um, and, and Indonesia and others, you, we just want greater cooperation there. Now, I think an important piece of this is, to me, the most important area for partnership is is in the political space. You know, are we, how are we dealing with human rights concerns, democracy concerns? How are we trying to make institutions work better to push back against China if they're trying to claim, you know, the whole South China Sea? Um, so this should not just be seen as a military effort. Uh, and I think if the military piece of it is prioritized above other things, obviously there's a risk that that, that creates an increased chance of conflict. Um, but the reality is the Chinese are are doing things. They are they're building military structures on on rocks in the South China Sea. They're ramping up dramatically their navy. They're uh, seeking to intimidate Taiwan. I don't think that means that we need to use that to justify massive new kinds of military spending. I actually think it means more that you need closer political coordination among countries. Especially since like the Australians have, you know, criticized China's human rights record and just been hammered with boycotts of, you know, Australian beef or wine or whatever. Like they've been left out on a bit of an island. That's right. They get the, the shit kicked out of them by China whenever they criticize them and they get punished in that way. And I think a, an agreement like this is meant to indicate, hey, we got your back. Mm-hmm. But I think it, it like I hope that this is, you know, it's not just manifest in the military space. It's manifest in other forms of cooperation, technology, economic cooperation, people to people exchange. And yes, speaking out together on issues of human rights. Yeah. Uh, Okay. so let's get back to France. So in 2015, Australia signed a sixty six billion dollar deal to buy submarines from the French. That deal is now canceled. That is obviously a huge economic hit for the French defense industry. And I, you know, clearly a political hit for President Macron that's going to cause him, you know, political problems, basically. Um, the French also say they only got a couple hours heads up before this deal was announced, which added insult to injury. But I have to say the reaction has been so, so over the top, almost comically over the top. The French foreign minister accused the U.S. of lying, called it a stab in the back, accused the Australians of lies and duplicity. There's all this talk of a crisis, questioning of America's commitment to Europe. The French recalled their ambassadors from the U.S. uh, and Australia. I'd point out that France didn't recall its ambassador to Russia, despite the Russians repeatedly trying to interfere in their elections, which kind of seems like a bigger deal. Uh, The French also say they're going to release documents showing the U.S. lied to them, that the real goal here was somehow to break up the French-Australian alliance to put France in its place, that this was like a deliberate attack on Macron. Like you're reading all of this stuff in the French press. Um, So, Ben, like... I genuinely think it's important for the U.S. to have close ties with European allies, especially the French. But this is so fucking stupid. I mean, isn't the more simple answer here that French submarines kind of suck? They're powered by diesel fuel. (laughs) They can't like like they can't last underwater as long. They have less capabilities. Like it's an arms sale. Like, what do you want from me here? Yes, it's a gross, huge, massive arms sale. Like that's what this is. Yeah. I mean, um, be careful. They're going to come after you now, Tommy. That's okay. I think that there's like there's different pieces of this. Some of them are more legitimate than others. So on the baseline, you're right. Like the Australians can buy subs from who they want. 
why wouldn't we want them to buy our subs? Um, and you know, why wouldn't we want to have this kind of closer partnership? Um, and, and of course, the French are going to be pissed. They lost a lot of money. Um, it's an industrial hit for them. Um, I do think it's a little weird that they kind of weren't notified <laughs> um, in the sense that, like, I don't know how important, like, surprise was. You know, like, um, if you had told the French a day before something, it would have leaked out. OK, you know, but mm-hmm. even that's that's like a small notification kind of rollout issue. Right. I think on the bigger issue, there's a couple of things going on. One, I think the French are probably going to try to extract something from us. A hundred percent. Part of this is like, it's like when you get in a fight with your your friend and and you know that you did something, not wrong, but your friend was harmed by something you did here, you know, and they throw a tantrum and then they're like, can I borrow your your car next weekend? You know, like I bet you the French are going to come back in this conversation with Biden. They're going to have some list of asks. Uh, they'll want to be made whole in some fashion for this. Yeah, I feel like France is a Brazilian soccer player who was fouled and now is doing his seventh somersault on the ground trying yeah. to, like, get the red card. Like, uh, we get yeah. it, guys. We'll, we'll get you back. Maybe, like, they could have been invited into this, you know, broader alliance. It could have been Aquifer or whatever. They, I mean, maybe that's the recommendation <laughs> here. I don't know. Well, that was the other point I was going to make that is, I think, important. I heard in, in, in the four years of Trump, I'd go to Europe and I'd get an earful about, well, you know, Obama started to pivot away from Europe and Ugh. there are these disagreements on things. And then Trump comes along and that this builds on a series of issues where the U.S. and France have been out of step and the French didn't like the Putin summit, didn't feel like they were brought into that, that Biden did. But, I mean, while some of that, I think, is, you know, is kind of noise, I think the, 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 the true point that's hard, it's just difficult, is that. I never understood this argument that saying that we were pivoting to Asia was at Europe's expense. No. Because what we're talking about is ending the wars in In the the Middle Middle East. East. The pivot wasn't away from Europe. It was away from things like the war in Afghanistan and the war in Iraq. Um, I do think what the Biden team needs to do is you actually want Europe to pivot to Asia with you. Like we want to have common positions on issues that are implicated by China, whether they're environmental or human rights or economic. We want a common front with Australia and all the countries I mentioned, but also with Europe. And it would be bad if out of this, the French and the EU were like, screw you, we're not gonna develop a kind of common approach to the Indo-Pacific or to China or all these things. Um, So I think the Biden team does need to figure out a way to kind of find more common ground here. But, yeah, I think some of this is quite performative um, and probably going to be used to try to leverage the Biden team for 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 concessions in other areas. Yeah. You know, Macron's been calling uh, NATO brain dead for a while and, you know, expressing concern about the waning commitment to the transatlantic alliance and U.S. commitment. Like, I, I just I do think it's there's something real here. There's something a touch performative. They're probably really pissed at their intel people for not picking this up ahead of time. I don't know. It's just hard for me to suss it all out. The NATO piece is always this talk about developing a more independent European defense. And, and frankly, that's fine. I mean, Europe, Europe, NATO can still be the kind of cornerstone of, of our alliance partnership. If Europe wants to develop some more independent defense capability, particularly to deal with challenges in their area, that's fine. I do think it's in America's interest and Europe's interest to have a common approach to these issues with China. Because if you're talking about trade irritants, if you're talking about democratic backsliding, like our basic worldview is pretty is pretty similar to the Europeans. So I think it'd be a mistake on both sides of the Atlantic to let these kinds of irritants kind of uh, like distract us from the fact that we, we kind of agree about how we'd like the world to operate, what, like what the rules should be and what the values we should be upholding. Like, let's kind of get back to basics here. And, yeah. You know, hopefully the French return to having an ambassador and and the gala party, you know, that was canceled, you know, gets rescheduled. <laughs> yeah, they probably canceled that big party. There's some some celebration of a war that like ended in the 1700s or 1800s. Yeah, I think like the Biden administration should be like, look, like Emmanuel Macron, we owe you one. We'll get you back. Like, yeah, OK, let's should, all like dial do it down. Let's they all should find out. a way to get yeah. him back and, and they should go an extra mile because we got this subcontract and we can all move on. Yeah, we all move on. Uh, speaking of French speaking friends, uh, Canada just voted, Ben, and uh, things are kind of the same. 
Uh, <laughs> Justin Trudeau is going to be prime minister still. He'll be the head of a minority government. Trudeau had called this snap election a couple of years early because he wanted to win more seats in their parliamentary system and gain an outright parliamentary, parliamentary majority. But voters said, nah, I don't think so. Uh, we're a little pissed that you called this election in the middle of the fourth wave of COVID. So it looks like liberals will end up with around 158 seats. Uh, the conservatives will end up with around 119 seats. Uh, with the, both those numbers are about the same. The new Democrats will get around, I think, 25 seats. Any big takeaways from you from this election? I, you know, listen to your guys' analysis of like kind of the California recall thing. Um, it's kind of a similar result in the sa- in the sense that it's basically what it shows is politics actually hasn't changed that much in Canada. Um, I mean, what's different here is that Trudeau himself called the election. Um, uh, but but yeah, I, I think it it shows you that this this idea of having uh, like a minority led Trudeau led government with a, a a partnership with the more progressive party, like people are pretty much comfortable with that. And and people should keep in mind here that even though it's a minority government. If you add together the liberals and the NDP, like this is a center left progressive government. Um, so to me, again, far, far preferable to a conservative government, even though the Canadian conservatives aren't uh, quite as insane as, as our conservatives. Um, so, yeah, it's a kind of status quo ante. And I think it, the message that I presume will be digested by the Trudeau team is like stability, you know, and, and kind of plug plug forward and, and make the best of this arrangement rather than going for the majority is kind of the, the order of the day now. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so the Russians also had elections, or at least they pretended to have elections. Um, those Russian elections are bullshit before they start because the most popular opposition figures, people like uh, Alexei Navalny, we've talked about before, are not even allowed to run in the first place. Uh, but the cheating doesn't end there. Uh, partial results of the election were released on Sunday. They seem to show that opposition parties had made gains. But then when the full final quote unquote official vote was released on Monday by Russia's Central Election uh, Commission, you'll be surprised to hear that that lead or that progress for opposition parties had been erased and that Putin's United Russia Party was now firmly in control and will keep its supermajority in parliament. Um, Opposition leaders are particularly angry about delays in tabulating online voting. it seems like that was the place where they fucked with the vote tabulations the most. Uh, so far, Ben, the reaction's been pretty muted. There haven't been huge protests like there were in 2011. Uh, one important development that did come out of this election, Ben, like around it, was uh, actually it involves American tech companies. So Navalny's allies created an app that was supposed to help Russians coordinate essentially their protest votes to help you figure out, like, okay, how can I have an impact even if we're not going to actually win the, these opposition parties? But Russian authorities threatened to prosecute uh, local employees of Apple and Google. And so both companies caved and removed the app from their app stores. Navalny's allies then tried to shift the dissemination of this like protest vote information to Telegram. Uh, but then Telegram removed the account that was releasing the information. So basically, you know, tough showing all around here for anyone who cares about you know freedom, democracy, or um, you know, who is hoping for a post-Putin future. But nothing real good. No, and, and people should understand that this was central to their strategy in the Navalny uh, team. They, they'd they worked for years to develop this concept of smart voting. And the basic idea is wherever you live in whatever election, and this is a parliamentary election, but they've they've tried to apply this to other elections too, you select the candidate who has the best chance of beating the Putin-backed candidate. So in one district or, you know, in one election, it could be like the the more liberal candidate and the other one it could be like a communist you know mm-hmm. but if you believe that russia is moving in the wrong direction this is meant to show that the the opposition is actually bigger than putin's block of voters by the way it's it's strategy that in different forms has taken root elsewhere in hungary for instance all the opposition parties that have hugely different platforms and different issues have similarly decided, hey, we're just going to pick the person, we're going to basically have a primary and pick the person who has the best chance of winning to be the guy to run against Orban. So this mm-hmm. is an innovation crossing borders. I think it's gross, man. Like, So these people do all this work. Navalny's in prison. He's almost been killed. His organization's been rounded up. People have been exiled from the country. And like on the eve of the election, 
Apple and Google are like, oh, yeah, we, we don't want to get in this fight with the Russian government. So we're just going to suppress this technology that was developed by other people. Yeah, like the like day before, right? I mean, yeah, the day before. How is it anything other than, you know, and I write about this a lot in After the Fall, like, but when you look at these tech companies, whether they went, meant to or not, like once you kind of become a partner in authoritarianism, like you, you're, you're going down a slippery slope. And to me, every tech company, you know, and Facebook is obviously the most extreme offender. And, and you had a great interview on PSA about their creepiness. But every tech company has got to take a step back and be like, what are we not willing to compromise for market access or profit? Uh, because right now, in this instance, how are they not like acting in support of Putin's electoral priorities by pulling down this app? I mean, uh, they obviously were. And, and uh, you know, this is a conversation that needs to happen in both Silicon Valley and, and Washington. Yeah, right. For example, YouTube has not taken down Navalny's videos, you know, going after corruption from, you know, prominent Russian officials, including yeah. Medvedev or, you know, Putin, like to their credit, right? It was, And that's Google, right? <clears throat> to their credit. Right, right, to their credit. And it was sort of su- surprising to see them cave so quickly here. Yeah, I mean, it, reading those Wall Street Journal articles, that series, the it's just so clear that they're still, despite like, actual genocidal behavior being fomented on their platform in places like Burma, they are yeah. still not adequately resourcing their, you know, trust and safety teams in places like Ethiopia, where history is repeating itself. It's being used for incitement. It's just really, it's really frustrating. Yeah. These are capitalist creations. They are built to make <clears throat> profits and grow. But I mean, there's, there's, it's got to, be attached to some value proposition, I think. And by the way, these tech companies usually traded on the value proposition. You know, we are connecting people. We are bringing the world together. So part of their marketing strategy over the years was tied to values. And in this case, a bunch of people did a lot of work. What the app does is it told you if you're going to vote, think of it in this, think if we had a bunch of parties um, in this country and you're going to a congressional election, you could check the app to see uh, okay, who, who has the best chance of beating the Republican? You know, um, and that's who you vote for. And and removing that after those people did that work, you know, that is betraying like any sense of a value proposition in your technology. Yeah, it's really tough. Um, speaking of uh, troubling technology, so let's talk about this uh, long New York Times story that ran over the weekend about the assassination of an Iranian scientist believed to be leading research into nuclear weapons technology. So to conduct this operation. The Israeli government reportedly smuggled a robotically fired machine gun into Iran that could identify its target using artificial intelligence and then be fired remotely via a satellite link. So some person, presumably in Israel, because this is a Mossad operation, was kind of like pulling a remote trigger to actually shoot this scientist in his car. Um, It's worth reading this piece in full because... The reporters on the piece, Ronan Bergman and uh, Farnaz uh, Fasihi, managed to report just a shocking amount of detail about all the planning. They also talked about how the operation was run by and approved by the Trump administration and that Bibi Netanyahu rushed to get it done before Biden took office and quietly hoped that the assassination would derail future negotiations over the Iran nuclear deal, like exactly what I think everyone thought he was trying to do. So very cool. Thank you for that, Bibi. But a lot of folks on Twitter, Ben, who read the article we're pointing out that this story doesn't spend any time questioning the legality of an assassination like this or talking about the morality of assassinating a scientist or the precedent it creates or like really there's no skepticism about, you know, Israeli intelligence about who this individual was and, and what his job was. And I just wonder what you made of that, Ben, because um, I've read Ronan Bergman's book uh, on Israel and targeted assassination. It's called Rise and Kill First. And it's like 700 pages long. And it does dig into all of these questions about, you know, the legalities, whether these assassination campaigns do more harm than good. But this time story just didn't really touch any of that. And I don't know. It was a little. Yeah. It was weird. It was really uncomfortable and gross. Yeah. Um, (laughs) And and, and I I, want to echo you like Ronan Bergman's a great journalist in that book, really wrestled (laughs) with kind of ethical questions and moral questions around, um, you know, things like drones um, you know, first of all, 
assassinating scientists is not the way to deal with the Iranian nuclear program. A diplomatic agreement that rolled back Iran's nuclear program would seem preferable to me than mm-hmm. like, you're not going to assassinate every single person in Iran who, who is a scientist, it, it, like just from the objective. Then in terms of the legality and morality, um, I, I don't want to live in a world where countries assassinate scientists in other countries that they're you know, they're not even at war with. Like, what is going on here, right? Um, and it's tied to this question of the automation of war. Um, the, the, like, we mm-hmm. have to be able to think. It doesn't mean that everybody's equivalent here, but, like, the Chinese are going to have that technology. Like, the Russians are going to have that technology. Like, the, how are we going to feel when they start uh, killer robots, start assassinating people, how do we feel when Russia assassinates people with chemical weapons in other countries? Well, how do we feel when an American drone assassinates ten civilians by accident in exactly. Kabul? You know what exactly. I mean? Like, we're barely exactly. reckoning with this. Yeah. And so this idea that we're moving into this space where we're eliminating any legal lines because we've assassinated an Iranian general, even though we're not at war with Iran, with the Qasem Soleimani thing. We're moving in this automation of war, and, and the U.S. use of drones has obviously been the most prominent aspect of this. Yeah, I, I, I think that, like, let's take a step back, because it was, it was written like it was like a spy piece, you know? It was yeah. written like a... It was like written a, like you were supposed to just be like, ooh, what cool technology. Yeah, like, oh, where, when's the film adaptation of this coming, you know? Profound legal, moral questions being raised about this, and questions, again, about, like, we are are we presuming that only the U.S. and Israel will ever have these technologies? Like, what what Pandora's box is being opened here? Um, and and yeah, I, I was disappointed to see that, and I do think that like we have to recognize that. Um, yeah, you wonder why the Iranians aren't uh, rushing back into the JCPOA, and you wonder why other countries are not talking to us about the 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 development of artificial intelligence and warfare. Like, I I would much rather see countries trying to figure out what are the constraints and guardrails we want to put on the development of new technologies in the same way that we did, imperfectly, but we did do that with nuclear weapons and other technologies in the past. Like, instead, it's like, let's just show how cool this is. And clearly somebody wanted, like, somebody was proud of this and gave this whole story to these reporters. Like, they they didn't just discover it, right? I mean, so the whole thing felt kind of uncomfortable. Yeah, I I felt the same feeling. I think like several months back, we talked about uh, a story about like AI drones that basically were not connected to any human and like were dispatched on the battlefield to go out and just like shoot at a target that matched some sort of like pattern of life that was assumed to be, you know, like enemy forces. Like there's very uncomfortable questions about these technologies coming down the pike. And like, it's weird that this New York Times piece just didn't even touch it. Then the drone issue, which we should continue to come back to, but like, it, it like, there's the question of whether you use that when you're in a war, and then there's there's a separate question about like whether you just kind of go into this place of of of, of assassinations too. I mean, there's there's so many issues that um, that 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 there's just no rules around them, no guardrails around them, and uh, you know that. This is going to be a big issue for the next 10, 20, 30 years because a lot of countries are going to get these technologies. So one of the biggest issues President Biden is dealing with right now is a new uh, border crisis in Del Rio, Texas. Um, There are reports that up to 14,000 migrants, most of whom are originally from Haiti, crossed the border from Mexico into Texas in recent days and built essentially a temporary camp under a bridge. So this town is like 35,000 people. All of a sudden, there's 14,000 migrants there. They feel overwhelmed. The conditions in these makeshift camps are just horrible. Um, a lot of these people who were born in Haiti and left, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, three years ago, whatever, have been living in parts of South or Central America for years and decided to make the journey north, in, in some cases taking them months, because they thought uh, that our, our rules had changed, basically. They thought Biden's decision may to extend maybe temporary protected status or TPS to Haitians currently in the U.S. could be applied to them too. Uh, For those who don't know what TPS is, uh, a a country can be granted temporary protected status because there's a conflict there or a natural disaster, and it protects individuals from that country in the U.S. uh, without documentations from deportation. You can get a a temporary work permit. So, you know, some of these folks in, in Del Rio now 
like, you know, they were living in Chile and they left because they couldn't find work or they dealt with racism um, and or they've been given misinformation about U.S. policy or they just had like, you know, a family member who lived in Maryland now and, and decided to risk it. And so the Biden administration response has been to start deporting them back to Haiti under Title 42, which is this Trump era rule that allows the U.S. government to basically deport everyone who tries to come to the U.S. in the name of preventing the spread of COVID. Um, In practice, this means flying people back to Haiti in cases where an individual hadn't lived there in years and years and years. And now they're forced to figure out how to live in a country that was basically an economic freefall before the president of the country was assassinated and before they experienced uh, another earthquake in July. So I don't know, just like pausing there, Ben, because I don't want to sound self-righteous about this because this is a brutally hard problem for the Biden administration. Like Republicans are going to blame him for everything that happens at the border, fairly or not. Um, the infrastructure to house people crossing the border is already overwhelmed. We were talking about this months ago. I'm sure they, the Biden team is worried that let's say they figured out a way to let them stay somehow. That could incentivize more migration. But all that said, like it is totally fucked up and wrong to deport people to Haiti right now, given the security situation, right? Like it's deporting everyone under Title II does completely disregard our asylum laws to the point where even Chuck Schumer um, is a, is criticizing this decision today. So like, again, I know I'm like literally sitting in the cheap seats, like outside of government criticizing one of the hardest things they'll deal with. But I'm just wondering if you have a thought on, on how they're handling this and what they should do. I did see that the Biden team said they're gonna raise uh, the refugee cap back to 125,000 in 2022. So that is a, you know, sort of a good piece of news. The question around the images that we saw, yeah. clearly what we should all agree on is that enforcement is grotesque and needs to stop. And I kept thinking, what does this look like around the world? This is America. This is still America. Donald Trump's not president and this this garbage is still happening. So I failed to mention it. What you're what you're mentioning is like customs people like a CBP on horseback chasing down you know, Haitian migrants. Basically. Yeah, and kind of flogging them, you know, yeah. and it kind of reinforces the kind of worst stuff we've seen in coming into Southern Europe, it dehumanizes these people. Um, and then there's this question of sending people back. I remember, you know, during the Trump years, I randomly was in <laughs> Cape Verde. Now, I don't think I was hanging out there. I was on like a, a, a stopover and, uh, on a flight. And I was talking to somebody there and I was like, oh, what's the issue here? You know, and it was like a lot of people had been deported back there who would like not live there, like you're saying, f- for for a really long period of time. I mean, the, the idea of like sending people back to a place that they haven't even lived recently, that is in a shambles, that has multiple challenges and, you know, earthquake and political violence um, that, that, that just doesn't strike me as the, the humane answer. And the thing that combines these two issues, the, the kind of the, the, the appearance in those images and the, the issue itself is like this, this feels like it's still a punitive policy. It's like punishing people that get to the border instead of an orderly rules based kind of legal policy where there's some process other than kind of rounding people up on horseback and putting them on planes to like adjudicate asylum claims. And look, it's a wickedly hard problem. You're correct. And like, where do you put them? And how do you finance that? And and, and how do you get more asylum judges? But like, I think we have to be going the extra mile to show that this is this is a kind of a being done with with an appreciation for the humanity of these people with like a fidelity to a set of rules and that it's it's not kind of punishing people who are already in dire circumstances to kind of make some demonstrative point you know um it, it's just and look it's it's haiti we have some ownership you know over the centuries um for the circumstances that those people find themselves in this is the same argument that i think Europeans have to wrestle with, too. You know, like, why should we, like, take our share of of refugees? Well, we created a lot of the circumstances that, like, contribute to the fact that there's still refugee flows from these places. Um, And so that has to enter into it. 
Yeah, not uh, chasing people around on horseback, treating them like cattle is like the bare minimum. You're, you're yeah, right. for the bare minimum. Let's at least clear that bar. Yeah, and let's be clear. I'm sure that resettling people in the U.S. who cross the border without documentation pulls horribly. We got to figure yes, out a way to do yes. with it. We got to yeah. make the case. Like, I'm well aware it's horrible politics, yeah. but sending yeah. someone back to Haiti where gangs are kidnapping people, where the Haitian government's basically saying, we'll give you a hundred bucks in local currency, best of luck. Like that could be a death sentence for a lot of people. And we just have to be honest about like the stakes here. And we should also be clear, like Joe Biden didn't order the border patrol to like chase people on like- No, is, the border patrol is an out like, of control agency. The, the, yeah, like so some of this has to do with like the need to, to reform the way in which agencies like the border patrol and ICE operate. Because clearly- you know, when the, the Trump people like unleashed, I mean, those were already challenging agencies in the Obama years. I don't want to sugarcoat it, but like Trump kind of unleashed, I think, the, the kind of fury of, of of those agencies. And so like reforming those has got to be a piece of this, too. Big time. Um, so the U.N. General Assembly is this week. That is the annual gathering where the members get together. Leaders give really long speeches, and then they try to coordinate on major issues, sort of on the margins usually. So President Biden spoke today. Then the media narrative going into the UN General Assembly, or UNGA, as we always called it, uh, is that everyone is mad at Joe Biden because of Afghanistan. They're all pretending that this previously mentioned dust up with France is some sort of big deal and overplaying that. Um, Biden has one-on-one -on -one meetings with Boris Johnson later this week. I believe leaders from Australia, India, and Japan are coming to the White House in a few days. Like, any big takeaways from, from news we've seen so far? The, the Xi Jinping announced some news uh, about coal that caught your eye right before we came in. And then, you know, any favorite Unga memories you want to share about, um, you know, all of us fucking trying to clean up some PR <laughs> mess at 11 p.m. in a hotel suite? I'll start with my favorite memory here, Tommy. I'm certainly the only person who had to write eight UNGA speeches for the American president. That's a lot. And they were immensely stressful because every piece of the government wanted to get their line in there in the UNGA speech. And Obama always wanted them to be good speeches. And so I was always navigating, you know, I remember Samantha Power one night, she really wanted him to, to have this line in there that was going to be like the first time that a U.S. president really hammered LGBT issues um, from the UN. So she was right. But I was out doing something. She was like sleeping outside of my door to get this line. <laughs> She's like banging on the door. She's there in the middle of the night, like just dog it exactly what you want from Sam. And then in the morning, Obama would always give me his final edits over breakfast and then immediately get in his motorcade and go to the speech. And making kind of no allowance for the fact that it took time for me to get his handwritten edits on the speech go to my laptop, insert them, and send it to the teleprompter guy, right? So one morning he's eating eggs and bacon and he's taking a long time because he worked out and he gives me a bunch of edits and takes off. Now, if people, you'd have to work for Obama to know that it, it, he was not that good at reading a speech in a binder on a podium. Like there's a teleprompter. And it's not that he didn't know the words and he needed the teleprompter because he had no idea what he was talking about. It's that like, do you want to watch Barack Obama looking down at a binder, flipping pages and reading something? Yeah, no, it's just where your eyes are, right? Yeah. So one year, I just couldn't get the speech to the teleprompter guy in time. And I, I, I thought I had, but there was like a mix up and the prompter guy had the wrong speech. And I see Barack Obama go up, take the stage, you know, the iconic, you know, shakes hands with the guy and just look down and start to read, you know, in these times. We, and, and it's like for about four minutes... I was like, oh, my God, this is going to be the worst hour of my life. <laughs> um, and then suddenly I see him like, look up. And I was like, oh, the prompter's on. There it um, is. We're um, back on. So small thing. Look, I think Biden's speech, you know, he didn't roll out big new initiatives. He, you, cl you clearly saw the argument that's at the heart of their foreign policy, particularly post-Afghanistan, which is we're ending the Afghan war and we're moving us into this new period. And the issues have to change that we focus on. And those issues are covid climate change and democracy slash China, right? And he kind of made that argument. I happen to agree with a lot of that argument. Um, he also went out of his way, I think, to say, we're not trying to have a new Cold War with China. We have to find ways to cooperate. I think that's a good message. I think it's important for people to hear that message. I, I think, you know, we'll see uh, in the coming months, there's a couple of big 
milestones out there. If the first phase of Biden's foreign policy was like America's back and kind of good feeling about that. And the second phase was kind of this Afghanistan withdrawal. The third phase is this fall, you've got the climate change summit in Glasgow. You've got mm-hmm. his first meeting with Xi Jinping and all probably in the G20. We'll probably find out whether or not we can get in the Iran deal. So to me, this speech is kind of a bridge to the next phase of Biden's foreign policy. On the climate change front, Xi Jinping made this announcement that China's going to stop building and financing coal plants around the world. That's a big deal. Um, you know, the, the concern was that China's taking steps at home, but they're building coal plants on the Belt Road Initiative. China, Japan and South Korea have been big financiers of coal plants. If, if they all get out of that business and the Japanese and South Koreans have made similar pledges, that's that's big. I mean, if we're removing international financing for coal, that that to me is a big step. Yeah. I mean, obviously, China hawks, we will uh, watch and make sure he actually does it before yeah, we that's give why him any praise. Yeah, like, you always, you know, what's the timeline? And are yeah, there yeah, yeah. exactly. You know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, ben, one fun thing about Unga is um, the good leaders show up and then all the shitty ones do too. I mean, we used to, speaking of long speeches without teleprompters, uh, Muammar Gaddafi used to speak for like oh, three, four that hours. That year was crazy. Remember, you were there. He yeah. like had an all-female bodyguard unit and spoke for hours and- he was like pitching a tent at. Do you sleep Trump's in the park? Place. Yeah, it was, was like Trump's house, maybe. He, it, like, it, it, the club in New Jersey. Um, right. I think like he's on the lawn there. It was a real Borat feel to that year. Yeah, yeah, that was a weird year. Yeah. Well, th- so this year, like the standout asshole so far is uh, President Bolsonaro from Brazil. He is unvaccinated because he's a Trumpist moron. Uh, he's going to be allowed into the event to speak because you kind of have to accommodate world leaders when you are leading the UN General Assembly. But what's funny is Bolsonaro can't get into restaurants, so people keep tweeting photos of him and his entourage eating pizza on the sidewalk in New York City because everyone's like, sorry, bud, you're not coming in. Yeah, I, the the picture looks hilarious. Like the, the, He seemed to think it made him cool that he couldn't go in to get a slice, and so he's hanging out with like his... like fascist enablers outside just like rocking a slice but like it's not that cool man you, you know? just look like you've been at the bars yeah yeah maybe yeah, he was yeah, 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 yeah. Probably, <laughs> who knows probably was one other quick unga story i want to throw out there please with our french theme remember the year that sarkozy surprised us for calling for a palestinian state in his yes speech at the UN i was Assembly? just thinking about this was this in your book S- yes so he surprises us just like we just surprised the french so just to show it can go both ways yeah. and obama was meeting with him right after and Obama comes in, he's like, he's just like, look, man, you, you got to give us a heads up. You know, just he's pretty casual about it. He didn't get all freaked out. Like, you know, he's just like, give us a heads up. And Sarkozy stands up and he pounds the table and he said, I did this because I despise that man, Netanyahu. <laughs> he humiliated you, Barack, in the Oval Office. And he made this whole speech about how part of the reason why he was doing it is like defending Obama's honor or something. And like, like Obama's like, look, man, just just give us a heads up. <laughs> you know, like, like, we need a heads up on these things. We need to work on it a little bit. Uh, uh, it, was, it was a wild, uh, it was a wild. And he's like, no, I'm going to, so Carly's like, I'm going to do Middle East peace. And Obama's like, yeah, yeah, get your Nobel Prize. I already got mine, man. Yeah, good luck with that, Sarko. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe just hire a good lawyer. A couple more quick things. So quick update uh, from Ethiopia. So last week we had uh, Nima Albagir from CNN join the show to talk about her like really brave, amazing reporting. Uh, about the ongoing fighting in Ethiopia where the government has been attacking and reportedly committing atrocities against the people living in the northern Tigray province. Last week, President Biden signed a new executive order that authorizes sanctions against the leaders behind those atrocities. So very good move here by the Biden administration. Um, And I think credit to Nima for her reporting, which I think probably shed a lot of light on what was happening uh, in the region and the reality of how dark it was. And I'm sure it was influential within the government, uh, certainly got a lot of uh, attention outside of it. So credit to her, credit to President Biden for doing something good. Yeah, no, we should stay on top of this. I mean, this is a story we'll keep coming back to because this isn't going away. This, But it's good to see that that kind of reporting has an impact. It ripples out. Yeah, it really does. Pretty amazing. A um, couple more things, Ben. So uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson made some news this week by finally confirming to uh, Savannah Guthrie on the Today Show that he has six children. Now, The context here was a question from Savannah about what it's like to have a new baby in the prime minister's residence. I think he said he changes a lot of nappies. Um, Johnson recently remarried. They just had a son. Like, congrats. Good for him. He also has four children with his ex-wife. But in the past, he has ducked questions about whether he had also fathered a child uh, in an affair. So I don't know why Boris decided to directly answer this question now. 
Uh, we know Savannah well. I, she could just be that good at interviewing. I suspect that's part of it. But I guess congratulations to Boris. Congratulations to the extended family. Uh, Godspeed to the uh, Boris Johnson communication staff who will have to now answer to all the British reporters who've been chasing the story for years since he just coughed up the news to the American press. But what, I don't know. All right. It's amazing that 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 someone could be like prime minister of the United Kingdom and, and like a, a prominent one too, like a giant figure and, and that people didn't know this. It's also amazing that like if, if you were like asking me like 15 years ago to plot like something where what could really bring down a politician, you know, um, like I, I'm old enough and maybe we're portraying our age that like when like an affair, like politicians careers could potentially be ended. Like it, it, the idea that they have multiple children that people don't know about was like, yeah, like, it was it rumored, you, like, but it wasn't, he just never confirmed it, which it just is mean even that, worse. Like, yeah. It just, it's so interesting how, some politicians can defy gravity because I'm sure that there are other politicians that if it came out, you know, that they had all these children with different women and you didn't know about it, like that, like imagine anybody becoming president of the United States without that getting out somehow, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I and I, I think like, who cares if you, if you, if you know, you have another child out of wedlock, whatever, I'm, I'm not going to yeah. judge you for that. I'm going to judge you for denying the existence of your own child yeah, or refusing exactly, yeah. to talk about your own child. Yeah, there's room for people to be human beings and to have like, you know, uh, so I'm not suggesting like a puritanical standard for all politicians. It's just, it's just curious to me that, that Boris like defies these, these laws of gravity that other politicians, I mean, I guess that's part of his appeal in a weird way. Like, yeah, like, yeah. Trump, you know. Sometimes he uh, literally dangles from a wire above uh, uh, towns <laughs> yeah, in the UK. Yeah. So what do, what do I know? Uh, last story, Ben. So I don't know if you saw this, but the Space Force released a prototype for its dress uniform today. It's basically gray pants that are just horribly tailored. Didn't fit either person modeling them. And then like a navy blue jacket. A little twist on the jacket is that the buttons run at kind of an angle on the side of your body. So that's the Space Force prototype. I, not a lot of innovation there. Well, also like a totally lost merch potential. Yeah. Like, what if, yeah, mean, what if they fund the fund the satellites and spaceships with the merch? You could. If we had like a crooked brainstorm on Space Force merch and uniforms, like we could have come up with something much better than that. You know, mm, that's a good point. Um, I'm sure Elon Musk is thinking that SpaceX can can up the game on that too. Yeah. Well, you know, he's certainly uh, doing well on the uh, on the government dime yeah, yeah. himself, <laughs> yeah, despite yeah, all yeah. his uh, faux libertarianism. The government um, dole. The, the other, you know, the other sort of international story that was out there, Ben, was Nicki Minaj, her cousin's friends, balls, um, the COVID vaccine. I, mm. I, I think that's kind of run its course. Mm. I didn't know if you had any thoughts. I, I thought everyone should watch, um, you know, the Trinidad health minister having to knock down this story about some sort of adverse testicular reaction to the COVID vaccine. But it lit I up guess, Twitter for a couple of days. Here's my my uh, world though take on that. It, whenever something like this happens, it, it kind of makes you feel bad for like the Trinidadians, because um, like they don't get a lot of spotlight on them, right? And like the one time that that suddenly the eyes of the world are on Trinidad is because of like Nicki Minaj's cousin's friend's balls. You know? Yeah. No, it's probably like, not good. Like that guy's. When is that guy ever going to have like international press attention on his on his you know press conference? You know, probably not ever. Uh, there were some <laughs> yeah. really amazing uh, local news reports going viral that kind of touched on that point, and they're like, "Come on, Nikki, get it together." Also, uh, collaborate with more artists from Trinidad when you're making your music, which I thought yeah, was like yeah. that's, that's a, a that's good, a fair yeah, some good that could come out of this. Yeah. Fair, yeah, that's some good. That's some good. Yeah. That we'll spin this one positive. Uh, TBD, if she ends up going to the White House, there was some confusion about that, but a story for another day. Um, all right, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, uh, you will hear Ben's conversation with Senator Chris Murphy, the least swampy foreign policy thinker in Washington, D.C., one of the smartest folks out there. So stick around for that. Yeah, not a member of the blob. Not a blob. So we are very happy to welcome back to Pod Save the World, Senator Chris Murphy. Um, Welcome back to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Good to uh, talk to you. I want to start on Afghanistan. um, And and we've covered this uh, very very closely on the show, including uh, the the particularities of withdrawal. But I want to kind of step back with you because you were one of the voices um, I think challenging the conventional thinking that this was the end of the world, um, that the withdrawal itself was a faulty decision. 
And and I think you know also speaking to the the fact that the the the, the hysteria in some quarters about the withdrawal kind of actually expose just how divorced from reality kind of aspects of our foreign policy discussion are. Now that we've had a little time, like how do you reflect on this as an inflection point potentially? Obviously, President Biden was trying to make this case at the UN that this is an inflection point. It, how is Afghanistan an inflection point and, and what does it say about kind of the disconnect between a lot of the, the kind of established voices on foreign policy and, and, and kind of the, the reality that Joe Biden's dealing with? Well, Ben, first of all, thanks for the great work you and the team have done on this, trying to sort of right size our expectations. <laughs> thanks for letting me put up a, a, an opinion piece on Crooked um, that sort of goes through what I see as the primary danger. So I'll talk about the inflection point. But first, you know, my real worry is that these lessons are refusing to be learned by the D.C. foreign policy establishment, that this this magical thinking I talked about in that op-ed about what we could achieve in Afghanistan just continued uh, into the way in which we talked about the withdrawal, this idea that we were going to be able to pull off a, a seamless withdrawal without scenes of chaos and confusion after the overnight collapse of the Afghan military and government. Um, it was frankly just as irresponsible um, as the endeavor we were engaged in for 20 years. Uh, neither was possible. In the end, 130,000 people you know, in two weeks is pretty damn impressive. And I just think it was unrealistic to believe you were going to pull that off um, without some scenes that were really hard to stomach. Um, you can't stop the Afghan people from rushing to the airport when they hear, hear that American planes are lifting off. But the overall theme here is uh, from the administration, I think, is right uh, that we have been bogged down in Afghanistan. And as you know, it's hard to sort of overestimate how much intellectual energy that takes yeah. um, inside the White House, the State Department, the Department of Defense. Um, and, and now we have sort of freed up uh, a lot of resource, um, both money, personnel, and intellectual uh, resource to be able to put into other projects, like, as we just saw, uh, the announcement of this new security agreement with uh, Australia. Um, I think you'll be seeing more innovative partnerships like that, in part because we just don't have to sort of worry about a, a U.S. occupation of Afghanistan in the way we used to. Obviously, there's still threats there. We're going to still be present. Um, but we have the ability now uh, to move on to fights that are actually winnable. Afghanistan, at least for the last 20, last 10 years, was clearly, in my mind, a fight that was not. You're exactly right. And everybody, I think, should check out your piece on, on crooked.com, uh, uh, which really lays this, this argument out. But before we pivot to use the word to some of the other priorities that, that I think that, that you would like to see America turn to, and I think President Biden is, is turning to, there's one other issue, which is the drone strike. Um, and, and the way I wanted to approach that with you, uh, with humility of someone who was in an administration that, uh, you know, I think overused and overly institutionalized use of drone strikes, when we see that, that degree of mistake and tragedy, um, and, and we're aware that we're still doing this in a lot of other countries, is part of the shift that you're describing to a different foreign policy have to be looking at whether and, and why we are continuing to use drones in, in let's face it, Yemen, Somalia, and North Africa? Uh, are you, from your purview on the Foreign Relations Committee, you know, given that we've seen this tragedy under a magnifying glass, what does it suggest about what might be happening in other places and, and how dismantling the war post 9 11 war on terror infrastructure, not entirely, but may, may have to include not just pulling troops out of Afghanistan, but looking at, at, at our use of drones and other military action in other places? Yeah, I, I think you have to back up 10,000 feet and then 20,000 feet when talking about this issue. To 10,000 feet, um, you have to understand the long-term consequences of continuing to make mistakes like this. There's a really interesting study out of the Northwest Territories of Pakistan that, show, that showed that in the areas in which we were using drones to strike at terrorists, um, we actually saw a growth in recruitment numbers, meaning for everyone we killed, two more were being drawn to the cause. And, you know, it's uh, not hard to understand why, um, because many of these strikes are hitting the wrong people, it ends up becoming recruitment fodder for the groups that we are trying to organize against. So we kill a handful of bad guys, often kind of run of the mill rank and file bad guys. Um, and then they just recruit twice as many because people are just so, so aggrieved at what the United States is doing. Um, but, you know, to sort of back up even further, um, drones have 
nothing to do with the underlying causes of terrorism, right? You are just trying to kill people um, and hope that the terrorist groups don't repopulate. Um, and the reason why, for instance, I have taken such an interest in U.S. policy towards Saudi Arabia is that, you know, I sort of figured out, as many of us did long ago, that the brand of Islam that Saudi Arabia is pushing out into the world um, this very conservative, very intolerant brand. It forms the building blocks of a lot of these extremist ideologies. Um, and if you really want to have a counterterrorism strategy, um, it can't be so heavily reliant on military force, whether it be through conventional means in Afghanistan or more targeted means like drones. You've got to ask yourself, what is driving all of these individuals, these young men, um, into the terrorist fold and have a strategy that gets at the root cause. And the root cause is not just poverty. Um, the root cause is also uh, a, the way in which Islam is perverted um, by many of these groups. And the U.S., I would argue, has facilitated that um, in many ways. So even as we're managing those uh, those ongoing issues, um, you know, you mentioned the kind of opportunity in ending the war to focus on on a different agenda in the world. And that's what President Biden focused on a lot today. He talked about China. He talked about COVID. Uh, he talked about climate change. Um, but part of what I think you know, the lesson you highlight from Afghanistan is, is America can't do everything in the world and we can't you know, control events beyond um, what is realistic in the world. What, what would you like to see kind of be the post if we're in a if we're in a post post 9-11 chapter? Um, if we're turning the page here, what, what is that agenda? What are the what are the issues you think the United States needs to be prioritizing in the world as we are winding down uh, the big chunks of the war on terror? I think China and Russia celebrate when um, we are so hyper focused on conventional military threats to the United States. Um, what I would like to see is a complete reorientation of the tools that we present to an American president um, so that the only thing um, so, so that we are allowed to do things other than deploy brigades and sell arms. Uh, and so, you know, when you look at a country like China, they are winning friends around the world, not necessarily through security partnerships, but through economic partnerships. And their development bank um, is 10 times the size of the U.S. development bank. Russia is undermining democracies through this massive propaganda effort. Um, they're spending similarly probably 10 times as much money on propaganda as we're spending on counter propaganda efforts. And so, you know, when the United States has more people working at military grocery stores than we have diplomats in the State Department, um, when the Department of Defense is the only organization that has the resources to, 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 to deploy quickly to conflict zones, you know, we get what we ask for, which is asymmetric warfare with countries like China and, uh, uh, and Russia um, that we're losing. Um, so to me, it's being willing to contest territory in non-military ways and deciding that we are going to actually plus up the State Department, plus up USAID um, in order to win those fights. Do you see that as connected directly to, to climate as well um, in terms of how we have a capacity to help countries transition there to clean energy? Climate and, you know, pandemic, right? So, yeah. you know, you... Uh, part of the way, to the extent that, that there are people around the world that are sort of asking themselves, wait, does the withdrawal from Afghanistan telegraph a broader withdrawal from the world by the United States? We can very quickly answer that um, by passing a substantial climate change initiative in the United States, which allows us to be a credible negotiator globally uh, and to supersize uh, our COVID relief efforts to um, dramatically expand the capability to produce and distribute vaccine all around the world. We could, within six months, answer the question, is America deploying or withdrawing? Um, and to do it with um, sort of climate change capacity and global health capacity will win us a whole lot more friends than deciding to make up for the withdrawal of Afghanistan by just invading a different country. And obviously, diplomacy enters into this. I, I, just because, given your recent travels, I wanted to 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 ask you a, a, a couple of quick questions. One is Lebanon. We've talked about Lebanon on the show and, and have had precious few answers. Um, you were recently there. Uh, what is there a light at, at the end of the tunnel? And, and what is the role of the United States in the international community in trying to help a, a country that is just besieged by so many problems? Well, there, there's no doubt there can be a, a, a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I will say Lebanese are sort of not convinced of that yet. 
um, of the folks we spoke to, half of them believe that Lebanon could survive this moment, but the other half, you know, worried that um, Hezbollah had so effectively just helped destroy uh, the economy and political infrastructure of the country um, that it wasn't going to be able to be rebuilt. Um, but they do have a government now. Um, it's a government of all the sort of same old corrupt players, but at least they have a functioning government. And there is um, a short term answer that the United States can be a part of. They've got a fuel crisis right now in Lebanon. They don't have enough fuel to power vehicles or to you know, run hospitals. Um, the Iranians are very publicly sending in tankers. And the United States right now is seen as the bad guy because there's a way to get fuel into Lebanon uh, from Egypt through Jordan and Syria um, that the United States can help facilitate. Um, we would you know, have to make sure it's not subject to sanctions um, and we need personnel to help effectuate it. Um, that's made difficult by the fact that Ted Cruz is holding up all state department nominees now. But if the United States was able to sort of figure out a way to get gas and fuel into Lebanon through this transit line from Egypt, we would be celebrated um, and uh, we would solve a short term problem. We would deal a blow to Hezbollah, um, but it takes uh, manpower to do that, that the State Department doesn't have. And it takes a bit of creative thinking on sanctions, something that has hamstrung the United States in the Middle East and a lot of other places. We get so addicted to sanctions that we don't yeah. see the, the damage they often do to our, our ability to be nimble. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And, and the last thing, I, you've hit this point about the, the, the lack of uh, confirmations. Um, what, 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 what is happening? Why is it happening? And in addition to just kind of breaking the logjam, should we be thinking about reforming a system that so handicaps the United States that people are, are languishing up there for, for months and years at a time sometimes? Yeah, I mean, I think right now we have one ambassador that has been uh, confirmed and almost no assistant secretaries who oversee these regions. So in the instance of that pipeline I'm talking about, it goes from Egypt through Jordan, Syria to Lebanon. No one ambassador can make that happen. You need an assistant secretary for the region that is amongst the positions that's being held up. Um, never before has a United States senator done this. Um, held up every single State Department nominee and every single Defense Department nominee because of a sort of particular compartmentalized objection they have with the administration. I hated the Trump administration's foreign policy, but I knew it was bad for the country if every single Trump ambassador and every single undersecretary um, wasn't able to be situated in their post. So I never held up every single one. You're asking how do we unblock it? Well, the first thing we can do is just work through weekends. I mean, right now the Senate packs up on Thursday afternoon. Well, we could work on Fridays and Saturdays and Sundays and we could begin to process some of these nominees. But second, we probably do need to um, add this to the rules that need to be uh, changed. Right now it takes about a day, um, day and a half to do one ambassador in the United States Senate. That's even after their hearing has happened. That's after their vetting process has happened. We could shorten that. Um, and maybe that's a beginning rules change that 50 Democrats could get behind that might open the door to you know, future bigger rules changes. All these pieces, and I, we covered a lot, but I'm, I'm from the Murphy wing of the Democratic Party, so I, I, I'd like to pick your brain. But I mean, what they kind of add up to is you're, you're, you're trying, you're, you're pushing against kind of a, a conventional thinking that, that is not ready to, to turn away from Afghanistan. You're pushing against a recalcitrant Republican Congress that is blocking nominees. You know, you're, you're, you're pushing against the lack of capacity in the U.S. government for some of these things. Um, but it, it does feel like at least these debates are advancing. I mean, do you feel like that, that in breaking a bunch of China, the, the Biden team is at least beginning to hopefully to open up some space where we can have some more structural change? And, and we'll end on this on this hopefully uh, some optimistic note. But uh, if, it, if, if optimism is misplaced, uh, uh, that, that, that can be the case, too. Listen, I've been, you know, really pleasantly surprised at the way in which this administration has sort of taken seriously this pivot. And it's not just a pivot geographically, it's a pivot away from a very sort of military first focus on America's power abroad. Um, it's not just the decide, decision to withdraw from Afghanistan. Um, Biden is proposing a, you know, double digit percentage increase to the State Department and USAID 
uh, budget, which is going to significantly increase uh, their capacities. Uh, so I, I do think that this can be that inflection moment that we're talking about. But back to this issue of nominations, the problem is, you know, the Department of Defense, um, its primary leadership, right, which is military leadership, yeah. doesn't need to be nominated and confirmed. Their secretaries do. But every day that you don't have assistant secretaries at state, you don't have ambassadors, yeah. it's another day that the generals are empowered. So um, to help the president sort of make this 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 pivot towards different kinds of power projection, we've still got to do our job in this. Yeah. Time. Yeah, no, you need people in there, need more resources, need to rebuild these agencies, and you need to focus on this new agenda. Well, look, thanks so much for, for joining and covering a whole bunch of stuff in a short amount of time, but um, it's great for our, our listeners to hear from you. People should follow you on Twitter, look, check out uh, the article you wrote for Crooked, and you, you, you pop up obviously all the time on these issues, but thanks for, for popping up here today. Yeah, appreciate it, and I'm glad to know there's at least two members of the Murphy Wing. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. You and me, man. Thanks. <laughs> all right, take care. Thanks to Senator Chris Murphy for joining the show. Thanks to The Blob for not getting to Ben's uh, Tenley Town studio before we concluded this recording. That's good. The Blob moves slowly. Yeah, yeah well, that's part of the that's part, that's of, the part of their appeal. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's why they're so hard to stop and, and also part of their challenge. When you called them The Blob, were you thinking of the movie or was it an acronym? Like, what was the genesis? I want to actually say this for the record, right? Please. Um, which is that because everybody else has their own definition of The Blob. I, as the person who, like, coined the term, should be able to, like, offer my own. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that article kind of, like, acted like there was... No, there is a very specific thing I'm talking about, which is it's not every single person who works in foreign policy. It is very particularly the group think among people who work on foreign policy that presupposes that military intervention in particular and uh, America's dictates can shape events in the Middle East. And this is in the context of the same people that had supported the war in Iraq were now giving a shit about the Iran deal and all of Obama's foreign policy. That's it, right? And, like, if you want to know who the blob is, just look at the more hyperbolic reaction to what Biden did in Afghanistan. Like, this is not a, it's not hard to figure out what I'm talking about. But the blob, to me, was a way of capturing a growing groupthink, you know, that kind of mm-hmm. overtakes people. Um, and, yes, it brings in, you know, defense contractors and think tanks and the kind of, you know, uh, hardcore Gulf funded uh, right wing pro Israel elements, you know, all this stuff. If you live in D.C., like it, it is kind of just all one big thing. Um, So, yeah, and Blob is very as a child, though, I was a big fan of old horror movies. My mom and I used to love to watch like Invasion of the Body Snatchers, The Blob. Those are some good fucking movies. Uh, people should go check out the back catalog. Yeah, there was some scary stuff. Uh, and they were like thoughtful and kind of interesting. And I see. I can't watch scary movies because they ruin my life. That for one's six good months. too. But because the silent the new place, ones, the silent place, that's a really good one because there's like some thought behind it. Like if it's just someone like sawing up people or something like that, that's not that interesting to me. But like if there's this kind of like vague, threatening thing that is growing, like. Oh, the quiet place. That that's a that's a good. Yeah. One. That's the one I, I'd uh, I love uh, I love n- another one of the people who who got really upset about the blob uh, terminology was a guy named Peter Fever who worked for the Bush administration. <laughs> and I googled him to be like, all right, what has this guy written recently? And one piece he wrote was a decade later, and the Iraq debate is still contaminated with myths, and it's all him, him getting huffy that people still accuse the Bush administration of conflating Iraq with 9/11. It's like, come on, man. It can be that so, intellectually dishonest and then get all worked up. The best thing about the blob in these debates is, first of all, I just kind of I, I said that to one reporter. And like the reason it became a thing is because of how pissed these people got. Right. Mm-hmm. And they're kind of proving the every time they open their mouth to to take umbrage, they kind of prove the point. You know, like, like yeah. uh, as that article does. But like, you know, the, the, no, uh, me and my colleagues in the foreign policy establishment, you know, uh, like are, 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 are not in the and something called the blob. We're just going to tell you the 10 reasons why the Iraq war wasn't as bad a thing as you think. You know, it's like, thank you for proving the point. I imagine some some guy in an ascot uh, removing his white gloves uh, to defend his honor as the Henry A. Kissinger Distinguished (laughs) Professor of Global (laughs) Affairs at the John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Yeah. People are like, what's the real title? There you go. That's a real thing. You, You, sir, are the blob. 
and the problem that they have is like the, how divorced they are from public opinion. Like there's, there's, I think someone in the article said that my problem was that I just couldn't change people's minds. So I resorted to name calling. Actually, it's the opposite. The only people who agree with the blob anymore are the blob. You know, yeah. like, it, like public opinion is not where they are, you know? They like to say things like, we got most things right except Vietnam, the Iraq <laughs> war. <laughs> And the That's majority of the quote. response to 9-11. That's yeah. a real quote that someone yeah. said. We got was that like Richard Haas right. or somebody? Yeah, yeah you got most things like wrong except the Vietnam War, the Iraq War, uh, the you know, Afghan War. It's like, well, <laughs> yeah, the lot. common thread is the wars. I'm so, all for the liberal international order. I'm a member of that club. Pro you know, NATO. Like, it, it, you, you could have all those things without going to war in Vietnam and Iraq and, and Afghanistan. Yeah, we'd be a little better off. Uh, okay, we've gone a little long, but that's okay because it's fun to talk about the blob. Uh, talk to you guys next week.